Yeah, let me begin just by expanding on Mario's point that uh, Niobe and I have kind of a marvelous partnership. I'm a historical kind of cultural filmmaker who's been working in the West and the North 45 years. He's a young anthropologist. So when we did Tipping Point, um, he did the science of the show and I did the kind of history and the kind of community, community relation to the tar sands and the impact on the environment of northern Alberta. So my talk today will, will, will be more on the side of just the impact on the communities of the north and very specifically the community of Fort Chip um, that I first visited in um, 1971. Um, I actually made my first movie up there. Um, I put together just two excerpts um, that give you a little feeling of, I guess, that continuum from the early 70s to now. Um, just five minutes from each clip. Um, one is from a film, Sakapa Majawan, which is Cree for man who chooses the bush, a film about a Métis trapper in the early 70s, um, when Chip was a very isolated community. And the second film is the one Mario mentioned, Tipping Point, The Age of the Oil Sands, uh, shot in the same community in 2010. Um, the, um, it's funny, Man Who Chooses the Bush documents a community of European and First Nations traditions that, f that come together to form a Métis view of the world that I think was sustainable and deeply integrated with the environment. Um, you know, where any kind of social, political, or economic decisions were meant to look forward seven generations. Tipping Point, by contrast, now deals with a community suddenly under extreme duress. Its environment turned toxic, its immediate future, let alone its legacy to its children and grandchildren, in question. So let's look at the first two clips and then I can talk about them. See, I got thrown out of the, out of the school when I was 11 years old. Well, the old man said, you don't want to learn anything in school, okay. He said, you'll learn how to live in the bush. So I went with my dad, and I've been trapping ever since. Two dollars, two dollars, Hudson Bay. Two dollars, more or less, set the trap again. Frank Ladisseur has trapped muskrat all his life. His trap line runs along the banks of the Athabasca River in northern Alberta. His father brought the family here when Frank was only 11 months old. They're Métis, or half-breed people and they were moving north into the solitude of the bush to get away from white civilization. They'd lost their land in the Riel Rebellion of 1885. 
sisi hiu kuta kaka ki poni pimat si peace. Let us pray for more peace on earth and more understanding and respect for each other in our families, in our village. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who suffer, for those who are sick in hospital, and we have few people from here who are in cancer. For those who feel lonely tonight, may God help them so that they may not give up hope. And I had two brothers, one was 13, one was 15. So one morning they, uh, they're going to attend the weasel traps. They were trapping weasels. And the river had just frozen a few nights before that. And they wanted to take the skates. So my mother said, no, don't take the skates, she said. But they managed to sneak in the skates in the, into their pack sacks and they took off on their place where they're trapping. And they portaged to the river, and this is the Athabasca River here. And they were coming home skating. I guess one spot there hasn't been frozen until just that night. Their little skim of ice is what? maybe half an inch thick, maybe, th maybe thinner. And they both went in there, they both drowned it there. I told my two other brothers, I said, let's go. Let's go and look for them. So I took a long pike pole, and from where they went through the ice, 70 feet down the river, that's where we found them. They, both, they were both laying side by side. Professor Schindler's research is complete. The findings are disturbing. The people of Fort Chippewan will be the first to hear them. Schindler's team has discovered cancer-causing heavy metals in the entire ecosystem, reaching as far north as Fort Chippewan itself. The metals that we're focusing on here are the 13... For the next metals. hour, Schindler presents the results. Tar Sands plants are releasing 13 toxic heavy metals into the river including arsenic, lead, mercury, chromium, and cadmium. One thing that is really odd is that while industry is denying that anything is going into the river, they have to report their emissions to Environment Canada. They've tripled the output of mercury into the environment between 2001 and 2008. The same thing for lead. Lead's gone up fourfold in six years. The same for arsenic. Uh, it's gone up threefold in seven years. We conclude that the oil sands industry is adding substantial amounts of contaminants to the river. The cancer rates in this community are quite a bit higher than would be expected. The rates of leukemias and lymphomas were about three times higher than would be expected. The rates of bile duct cancer were seven times higher than expected. The things that are interesting and worrisome about those particular cancers is that they have already in scientific studies been linked to exposures to petroleum products. I can't say what's causing the cancers here in Fort Chippewan. There's something, something causing it. We need to work together to find out what that something is. I got one question here for the four doctors. I know where Suncor's uh, oil plant is and your uh, tailing pond is right on top of the bank and your Athabasca River is right here. Do you believe that there's underground seepage from Suncor's tailing pond into the Athabasca River? Are you sure you're positive? S scientists never deal in certainty, but I'd say the probability is 99%. My name is Crystal Ravitz. I'm 31 years old and I found out that I might have ovarian cancer, waiting on my ultrasound results. How do you tell your kids that you're sick 
how do you explain to them when they've already lost so many family members to cancer? It's, it's the hardest thing in the world to tell them. Something has to be done. I love my home, I love the people around me, and I don't want to lose any more people. Especially family. Especially me for my kids. Thank you. Our people have to eat too. They, they're working down there. They have to support their families. They have no choice. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of stuck because I got a lot of family members down there. But um, I also don't want them to. I don't want to bury them too. I worked for the plants. I worked for them for five years. So I think we have to all take a hard look at ourselves and say, do we want those jobs and keep dying? Right now, I think there's about 10 or so active mines running, up and running. I believe that's something like 42 more coming up, 42 proposed projects. Like the numbers that we're showing, or you guys are showing us today, would that be times 42 in the future? Because I think that the signs are there, the numbers are going up, it's only gonna get worse. I don't wanna see it go tenfold anymore. I don't wanna bury any more friends and family. Earlier on today, I witnessed uh, this whole room stand up all at once. That's strength. That's unity. That's what this town was lacking for the last 40 years. Now I believe we have it. Now that we have it, let's use it. Let's do something. I have a two and a half year old son right now. I have one more on the way. You know, I don't want him and, and my unborn child standing here in my shoes at my age telling the same story again. You know, I want him to tell a totally different story. I want him to say that, yeah, we got industry here and they're cleaning up the mess that they made. July 13th, 2010, we're shooting aerials over the tar sands. The helicopter hugs the bank of the Athabasca River, skimming the tops of poplars and tamaracks. Then the pilot spots a wolverine climbing out of a gully below us, swinging its head back in defiance. Karaju, in my grandfather's stories, defender of the northern wilds. I try to imagine the animal, eyes fierce as in the illustrations I loved as a boy in the books of Ernest Thompson Seton, the Arctic prairies, wild animals I have known, lives of the hunted, accounts of Seton's travels in the Northwest. When Seton traveled this section of the Athabasca in 1907, his matey guide, Belaise, was treed near Fort Chip by a wolverine protecting her cubs. The greatest plague the hunter knows, Seton wrote. Solitary, tireless, the wolverine often covers a territory of up to 700 square kilometers, scavenging the kills of predators like the wolf and the grizzly, springing traps, robbing the caches carefully set aside by man. This is the only wolverine I've ever seen, but it's strange how familiar the animal seems. Tracking it like this from the air, it just feels, you know, super real. But why would the loner Karaju be here, so close to the industrial frontier, patrolling what little's left of its wilderness domain, so close to the sacrifice zone? For a moment, the wolverine stops under the swaying poplars, as if to will us away, and then is gone. There are many tipping points precipitated by the oil sands due to the enormous scale and speed and the rush to keep the world supplied with fossil fuels. The film I mentioned earlier with Niobe on the scientific side, I'll just list some of the tipping points that the science is coming up against now. You know, the first, I think, is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Scientists once thought that 350 parts per million was a line we could not cross or we'd cross at our peril in terms of climate change. Now we're very close to passing 400 parts per million 
And the melding of the Arctic ice this summer tells us things are moving much more quickly than we thought possible. Needless to say, the oil sands are a significant contributor to Canada and the world's problem. The tipping point of water consumption, which I'll touch on later in my talk, um, and the effect that has on downstream communities, which depend on the Athabasca River for sustenance. Connected to that is a tipping point simply in habitat available to the animal populations of the boreal forest. And that's sort of the downstream impact on the Peace Athabasca Delta, a World Heritage Site. But to me, probably the most important tipping point um, is on the lives of the First Nations communities living downstream. Uh, the deformities and toxins found in the fish they eat and the growth of cancer rates in both young and old members of the community. Um, as you could see from that community meeting, these problems have been the focus of scientists like David Schindler, uh, winner of the World Water Prize in Stockholm, and John O'Connor, the town doctor. It's interesting, the other person that I sort of encountered, <laughs> ironically, over the years of working in CHIP, um, was Peter Lougheed. Um, the first film I made, uh, I guess in like 2004, I think his interview was the strongest interview saying that we had to sort of get control of what was going to happen in the north. He was visibly shaken when he flew above the oil sands for the first time and realized the impact of what lay ahead. He stressed again and again that the oil sands were owned by all Albertans and it was Albertans who, who should take control of their future. Um, as leader of the opposition in 1970, Lougheed visited Fort Chip to inspect the falling water levels in the Peace Athabasca Delta. Interesting, this time not caused by the oil sands, but caused by the construction of the W.A.C. Bennett Dam on the Peace River in B.C. The spring f floodwaters, um, the dam was nearly complete and the spring floodwaters were being held back and the delta was just drying up. Lougheed was acting on the research of biologist Bill Fuller at the University of Alberta, published in a paper called Death of the Delta. Fort Chippewyan was the first European community in Alberta. I always think it's kind of ironic that, that you know, this out of the way uh, First Nations community was, even from a European point of view, because of the kind of northern direction of the early fur trade, the first, the first European community in Alberta. Um, but just was a small fur trade post built on the site of First Nations hunting, fishing, and trapping camps, which had existed on the shores of Lake Athabasca for millennia. Lougheed was concerned that its traditional way of life would be swamped by the massive hydroelectric project on the Peace River. I guess actually swamped is the wrong word. <laughs> it, it, uh, the opposite of swamped in terms of the complete drying up of the delta. Um, all in the cause of uh, power for Vancouver, is why they were building the WAC Bennett Dam. He, Lougheed was also concerned that a sense of community, I think he had a great sense of Alberta community, um, shared by all Albertans, was under attack by distant corporations, BC Hydro, and governments, the BC provincial government. Uh, Lahi's understanding of the province's history, going back generations in his own family, was in his mind a critical lens through which to understand the oil sands. You know, he often asked the question, what was public wealth? Um, how do we define the public good in a democratic system? Um, and, you know, looking all the way back to his own grandfather who'd come to southern Alberta in the 1880s, you know, what of the values of the early pioneers in Alberta could 
be applied and learn from when we're dealing with something like the oil sands. Going all the way back to the first Europeans that arrived to build the fort at Fort Chippewyan, a uh, quote from Alexander Mackenzie's diary. At about 24 miles from the fork, by that he means the fork of the clear water at Athabasca Rivers, are some bituminous fountains into which a pole 20 feet long may be inserted without the least resistance. The bitumen is a f in a fluid state, and when mixed with gum or the resinous substance collected from spruce fir, serves to gum our canoes. Mackenzie was descending the Athabasca River in 1789 in search of a, what he hoped was a western ocean and the riches of the Orient. But Mackenzie's river of disappointment, as my grandfather described it, led north, not west. Um, and Fort Chip became probably as far west as he, as he got. It's amazing to think today um, the riches that now lie on that shore. Some people say half of the world's known oil reserves, 174 billion barrels, in an age when the world is running out of fossil fuels. 20 massive oil sands plants are being built at the cost of a trillion dollars to process the bitumen the source of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons carried downstream from these factories. PAHs are released by the process of separating oil from the sand and are linked to abnormally high rates of cancer in First Nations communities. Chip, as the locals call it, sits atop a granite bluff above Lake Athabasca, 150 kilometers north of the tar sands. A mixture of Cree, Chip, and Métis is the oldest, the oldest European community um, and probably one of the oldest First Nations community in northern Alberta. When I first worked there in 1971, the access was by river or by a bush plane which brought the mail once a week. The streets were unpaved and the water was delivered by a horse-pulled wagon. I made two films in that first three years there, Death of a Delta on the um, the study, the biologics, biology of the, de of the Peace Athabasca Delta, and it's drying up. And a second film, Manor Chooses the Bush, which you saw an excerpt of, that's the portrait of Frank Ladiser, who was president of the Métis Association. Um, Frank was so closely involved in the life of the community and the life of the Delta that he really led the fight against BC Hydro and the Bennett Dam. Latticer means sweetness, and despite the dislocation of his people, Frank was a great optimist, a fighter in the tradition of Gabriel Dumont. Short, broad, muscular, the kind of man who pulled the local Hudson Bay trader across a desk when the man tried to cheat him on a fair price for his furs. But in spite of all his work, BC Hydro in Vancouver ignored the Métis, and in Edmonton, Social Credit Premier Harry Strom made a pact of silence with W.A.C. Bennett, another SoCred, the BC Premier, after whom the dam was named. The two great religious dynasties of Western politics, righteous as they were oblivious to the rights of Native people, thought they could sweep the issue under the rug but the Métis had more fight than the two premiers bargained for. I remember sitting with Frank one morning in his beat-up outboard, drifting across Lake Mamawi, where the Peace River feeds the delta from the west. We're drinking tea he'd made from his tiny propane stove at, in the middle of a lake, just everything sort of precariously balanced on the, on the sides of his, of his small boat. Everything around us is sort of in moving in slow motion as an imperceptible current moves the vast waterland north towards the Riviere de Rachur, the outflow into the Slave and ultimately the Mackenzie River. Above us, the sky pulses with the wings of migrating pelicans, ducks, and geese. 
As the sun sinks, lake and sky become one, horizonless, color of pearl. The moon and Venus rise over the expanse of water to the east. A hundred years ago, Ernest Thompson Seton marveled at the bird life that gathered along these shores. A quote from him, the morning came with a strong north wind and rain that turned to snow, and with it great flocks of birds migrating from Athabasca Lake. Many rough-legged hawks, hundreds of small land birds, thousands of snowbirds in flocks of 20 to 200 passed over our heads going southward before the frost. About 8.30, the geese began to pass in ever-increasing flocks. Between 9.45 and 10, I counted 114 flocks, averaging over 50 birds each, and they kept on at this rate until 2 in the afternoon. So high they looked not like geese, but threads across the sky. Today, wildlife biologist Kevin Timoney calls this same flyway a mortality sink as the delta funnels the birds south over the tar sands. Thousands disappear on that journey. The vast tailing ponds look like lakes from the air, and no matter how many deterrents the companies put in place, the birds keep trying to land on them. Year by year, the raucous migrations that Seton marveled at have gone silent. Frank Laddister, I guess by the, by the time the, um, the evening had followed, he packed up his teapot and the bannock we'd had for, uh, for our meal, started to make his way back through the delta to Fort Chippewyan, telling me stories about, about his family, three generations on, on that lake. The um, story I loved uh, the most was he had once been exactly where we were on Lake Mamawi, uh, and he was again preparing this sort of uh, portable lunch on this, the bow of his boat, and he tripped over his fuel line uh, that ran to his outboard engine. As, as he was sort of preoccupied with his kettle or whatever it was. And his weight disconnected the line. And to make matters worse, as the boat tipped, he knocked the fuel line overboard. The metal hose was heavy enough to sink to the bottom of the lake. Considering his predicament, Frank noticed a flock of whistling swans go by. As they circled to land, he began to pay particular attention to their long, slender necks. Would they stretch the two feet required to connect the fuel tank to the engine? He was ready with his rifle when the next flock approached the boat, and within the hour he had a new fuel line pumping gas to the outboard. When we get back to Chip, which is now by the light of the moon, Frank's father, Modeste, uh, is at the dock to greet us. The delta is 500 kilometers wide and often less than a foot deep, so you can imagine how you have to know, know it in, intricately to navigate it. Modeste La Latticer um, has with him a fiddle and a bottle of whiskey. Um, it takes us to the, the uh, cabin near the lake. We're in the Latticer kitchen. Um, he soon begins to play the Red River jigs that his people had brought up from Batoche on the Saskatchewan. The St. Anne's Reel, the Ciel de Manitoba, Riel's Farewell, they all carry the memory of a prairie republic won and lost. The old man's gnarled fingers fly up and down the strings and his moose skin moccasins tap out the tunes on the linoleum. It's interesting that each moccasin is beaded with three intertwined Alberta roses. The furniture is pushed aside and a party flows through the house. Sweat pouring from his brow, Frank dances one by one with each of his twelve children. Among them is Big Ray, who towers over his father, but whose feet move like quicksilver. Forty years later, when I went back up to make Tipping Point, Big Ray was leading the fight against the oil sands. Modeste, his grandfather, died in 1978 
Frank died in 1990, long before the community began to suspect that their water was poisoned. One of the last trappers and fishermen left in the community, today Ray tells me that the place where Frank made us tea on Lake Mamawi is dry as a bone, not even enough water left to brew the tea. Since the construction of the tar sands upgraders, with their huge intake of water, 80% of the Delta's rivers and lakes have become inaccessible by boat. A way of life is disappearing. It's not just the hunting, fishing, and trapping the Chippewyan and Cree people were promised as long as the rivers flow in the treaties. It's the sacred places, the meadows where they once collected medicines, the graveyards where their ancestors are buried. As Alan Adam, the chief of the Fort Chip First Nation says, we have a treaty with the Crown in which our traditional life is protected. We just don't have a place anymore on which to practice that life. Big Ray takes me to the place where the clear water joins the Athabasca. That's just north of, of Fort McMurray now, that Fort McMurray is just pushing so far north. Um, as we're there at evening, we see a wolf standing in the water that barely reaches its ankles along the shore. Its tracks crossing mud flats where river channels used to run. <clears throat> Alexander Mackenzie's diaries talk of the fork at this spot, a headland from which he watched the currents flow on either side of him, then join forming one vast stream of moving water a quarter of a mile from shore to shore. Today it's probably less than half that width. Big Ray tells me that places where rivers meet hold great power for the Métis, sacred sites that command respect. It was no accident we found a wolf there. It's bad medicine if one damages the spirit of such places. Measurement of the Athabasca this fall showed the lowest water levels in the river's history. Biologist David Schindler warns that global warming is melting the glaciers from which the river flows, causing summer flow levels to drop nearly 30%. Now with more than 20 new water licenses been applied for for the oil sands projects, the amount of water that we've pulled from that river uh, will be 363 million cubic meters of water. Within a decade, five times the current drawdown will be taken from the Athabasca. A commercial fisherman, Ray Latticer, began to find deformed fish in his nets and report them to the government in 2005. Eyes and cheeks were eaten away as if by acid, tumors the size of baseballs. When the officials ignored him, he took the fish to the town doctor, John O'Connor, who called David Schindler at the University of Alberta. Maybe medicine or science could figure out what was happening. O'Connor and Schindler began to suspect the water. Two years of research, supported by non-profit foundations, pointed to the oil sands tailing ponds. Hastily constructed and porous, they were leaking toxins into the groundwater, which in turn was seeping into the river. Dr. O'Connor went to the press with the possibility that the deformities in the fish could be connected to high incidences of cancer, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis among the town's residents. Cholangiocarcinoma, cancer of the biliary tract, which normally occurs once among 100,000 people, has two confirmed and three suspected cases in Fort Chip, with a population of 847 people. I talked earlier about my grandfather and, and his library where I first, first read about the Peace Athabasca Delta and Ernest Thompson Seton. Uh, my grandfather had come west as a young newspaperman and traveled north in 1909 to see the tar sands for himself, long before any viable commercial process had been discovered to refine the oil. And interesting, 
they did call it the tar sands in those days. <laughs> uh, I guess long before the um, advertising agencies changed the way of speaking of them. As the publisher of the Saturday News in Edmonton, Watt was preparing an immigration supplement on the last Best West. The future of the tar sands were a big selling point, as well as the immediate construction of a railroad to Fort McMurray, to be known as the Alberta and Great Waterways Railway, to connect the mother load to the outside world. But Watt never actually got to see the bitumen oozing from the banks of the Athabasca. Boarding a steamboat in Peace River, he slipped on the gangplank and fell 20 feet below to the rocks, fracturing his leg in three places. The boat went without him and he was a month recovering in the Grand Prairie Hospital. But in the years after that fateful trip, my grandfather just continued to buy shares in the failed endeavors, many of them that were trying to make the oil sands pay and, and, and uh, find a way to export the oil from what they knew was just this treasure trove. As each newfangled project went bankrupt, he would give us kids the, worth, the worthless share certificates. I remember we just had trunks of them, we'd play kind of Monopoly games. Um, pipe dreams like the great Canadian oil sands, Fort McMurray bitumen, Northern Lights natural resources. The names promising so much echo through my childhood. But oil along the Athabasca would remain too remote, too technologically complex and expensive to extract. To see, the, and yeah, just too expensive to see the light of day. Now he knew that a tipping point in the history, in the very nature of the province lay ahead when the Suncor development in the 1950s began to discover a way of exporting the, the resources in an economic fashion. Those final years I would sit in my grandfather's study listening to his stories of a journalist's life in the West. All around him were all the, the books from Ernest Thompson Seton to the proceedings of the Royal Geological Society to the economic histories of Harold Innes, um, all of which looked at the resource extraction in the Canadian North. It's, but one of his favorite um, articles, because he had all these scrapbooks full of all the newspaper clippings he had saved over 40 years of Alberta history, <clears throat> was an obscure article from F.R. Scott who was actually a Quebec historian, who'd been fascinated with both the romance and the tragedy of, he would call it the tragedy, of Quebec and Ontario lumber industries. Scott had a special affection for the songs the lumberjacks would sing about their distant bosses, because they were all working for people in upstate New York and uh, Massachusetts. <clears throat> one, a refrain from one of their songs goes, they gave away the forest, they gave away the land, they gave away the rivers, they gave away the sand, they gave away the silver, they gave away the gold, they would have given away the air, but the air they couldn't hold. With the pace and scale of development in the oil sands, it's sometimes easy to forget that a river still runs through it, a river on which Albertans have charted the course of much of our history. And if you take the long view, I'd say on which our history may depend. I think of Frank Latticer and how deeply his family put roots down here, these northern waters in, in their blood. The family still traps in Fort Chippewa and Big Ray has sons. And as a family, they're still the keepers of, of a land that sustains them. But year by year, the shadow of the tar sands is moving silently, surely north. Big Ray and Chief Alan Adam would argue that as a community, they're reaching a tipping point beyond which living off the land in northern Alberta will be next to impossible.
the, I'd just like to finish um, when I was work, thinking about, you know, what to say about the film. I came upon a, a chapter in, in Barry Lopez's book uh, of Wolves and Men dealing with First Nations and their relationship to the wilderness and the, the disappearing animals, very much what Big Ray and Alan Adam are going through in, First Chippewa, in Fort Chippewain. Um, and Lopez says that the spirit that kept the people together through time, he's just talking now about First Nations, even as individuals was passing away, one of the most deeply felt emotions in the native soul. Every year in small and large ways, the spirit of life, of tribal identity and solidarity, of the individual's place in the tribe was renewed or is expected to be renewed. In preparation for the Hadatsu Sunrise Wolf Bundle Transfer Rite, an old man named Small Ankles lamented with his son that it was going to be hard to do the ceremony properly because it was hard to find a wolf around anymore. In the transfer rite, the Hidatsu engaged in a kind of historic breathing, inhaling the past and emphasizing its place in the now, the present. To lose the ceremony would be to lose the past, to be undefined, nothing broken. The time of the First Nations, small ankles knew, was in great danger, as was the time of the wolf. And that's about exactly where we are in Fort Chip today. Thank you. Thank you.